Mike McConville here for String Tech Workstations, Stratford, Ontario, Canada. So we have this Taylor guitar, Michaels, that you saw earlier. The neck has already been reset on this one, but I thought it'd be an interesting video to sort of bring you in the loop on Jody's Martin guitar as well that needs a neck reset. So both of these guitars have mechanically attached necks. So in this video, we'll do sort of a taste test comparison between the two different neck joints and how they're attached and what's involved in resetting them to the proper angle. So you've already seen that Taylor guitar. Let's zoom in on this Martin guitar and have a look. Well, it is definitely a horse of a different color the way the uh, Martin bolt-on neck works. So let's get these strings off and I'll bring you in. I wanted to bring you in first to show you that this little wooden plaque here is actually adhered with like a foam two-sided tape. So that needs to come off first. That is what we've got. We need to squeak out a little bit more of that neck set angle so we will have to heat this up, slip that off, pull the neck off completely. So this is a different animal than the tailor. And that does it. Boy, oh boy, that was a that was giving me a rough time. Feel the smudging here. Just put a little bit. 3M final finish. You get it at any automotive store. I'll carry this stuff. There's a few different companies that make similar products. They're not burn marks. They're compound marks. From the uh, each time I sharpen that probe, I put a little bit of compound on it. So that's what's that's what you're looking at here. Those black marks that will soon be gone. Voila, so now we're going to just very lightly sand. Again. Okay, here's a tip for all of you guys that are still sort of navigating your uh, GPS units. This Martin guitar that we're doing a neck reset on, there's lots of times where I like to flip it up like this and have access to the heel of the neck in order to sort of change that neck angle slightly. I'm going to back up for a bit because I want to show you what you need to do. When you put the Allen key on the underside of that platform, you see that screw rotating? Well, that acts as a positive stop. So when you slide that neck assembly forward, the, the male rail on the underside of the large U-channel, it butts up against that protruding threaded fastener. And it acts as a positive stop. So that's what allows you to actually do this and flip this vertically. So I'm going to clean up all this extra glue and we're going to do a dry run on this and we're going to buy back all those years of string pull and we're going to tilt that neck back a little bit and that's going to give us control for the action. Okay, we're going to bring you in here and I am going to clean up that top. Now this is one of those short scrub blocks that you guys have in your fretting kits. This is a good example of where I use the shortest scrub block. Very quickly cleans up that glue residue and levels off those nylon indexing pins. To give us Most of you have seen that video I made on making these little sanding sticks out of tongue depressors and this is a perfect example of where I use this. So I'm starting here 
and I like the fact that there's a bit of flex in that tongue depressor and it allows me to favor the inside closest to the tenon. It's okay to have a little tiny bit of a hollow around where the tenon meets the actual heel. The availability and affordability of the tongue depressors is obvious, but that's not the only reason I use them. When you're sanding, I can actually put a little bit of a helixical twist on that tongue depressor to make sure that I stay away from that outside edge. You've got to watch it. That outside edge is the one you're going to see when the job is done. So taking that die grinder again, I want to take a little bit more off here. <laughs> shortcuts here. You've got to kind of go back and forth until you get a nice fit against the uh, against the guitar side all the way along from the tip right up to the underside of the fingerboard. So I'm going to reach in with that screwdriver and I'm going to loosen that off. So what I want you to pay attention to is this seam. I'm going to reach in there and grab that fastener. Now I have snugged that right down, but that, we're not ready to do that yet. So this actual seam here, watch that lift when I release. See this space here? Well, that's where I use the die grinder to kind of take off the most of the material at the tip and, and about an inch up from the tip. So the rest of this edge needs to be gradually blended from where we use the die grinder right up to the underside of the fingerboard. The neck angle is perfect. I've done the reset. This is dry run and this is why I'm taking you in right now to explain exactly what I'm doing and why I'm doing it like this. So these two pins here actually prevent the neck from swaying this way during the reinstallation. Here there are two larger holes. These two holes are drilled so that the next guy, whenever that is, it could be 30 years down the road or whenever, those are pilot holes for the steaming needle. When it comes time for a neck reset next time, this is going to be like Christmas for the guy doing the neck reset because when he pulls that fret out he'll see that it's all ready to go. In fact, that's probably not a bad idea for Martin to incorporate in their design. And incidentally, this needle is, uh, I bought a couple of these years ago, I put it on my uh, cappuccino maker, it allows me to sort of get in there and steam. This was Brown's Guitar Factory, John Brown. I'm hoping he's still in business and business is thriving, but anyway, that's where I got it. So like I said, when it comes time for a neck reset next time, this is like paint by numbers for whoever's got to do that. So I just got off the phone with a Martin Tech Support fella and I would asked him one question, one question only. These fingerboards that are some type of composite plastic, um, I asked him, can I just use regular wood glue for that? And he said, yeah, no problem, that's how they're designed. So that question is answered. So I will just spread wood glue on the underside of that fingerboard extension. I have a, I have a call, a wooden call that I'll use to sort of clamp that down. And then for the tenon and mortise, I'll mix up some hot hide glue. So I've got this, this cute little uh, Lee Valley double boiler set, which is awesome because it's a little tiny glue pot. So I've got those hide glue crystals, and we're just going to add a little bit of water to that. We'll give that a stir in a second when it heats up. And this is the double boiler jacket for this hide glue pot. So this is like pewter, so it's quite heavy. 
So that just goes on the hot plate in the saucepan full of water. So we'll have that hide glue heated up in a second. By the way, this, this uh, hot plate I got from Canadian Tire, I think it was $13 or something, might be 15 bucks. The one I got from Lee Valley that came with this thing was junk. Sorry, Lee Valley, I know you're known for quality, but in this case, you failed miserably. We're just letting that heat up and we'll glue that Martin neck back on. There are six different planes that need to be considered and that you have to check before you glue that neck into place. It has to be right this way and this way. It's got to be right this way and this way. And what we did was we set the neck back. And it also has to be right this way and this way. So we're going to check first along the string path going from, we're going from the sixth string to the six string bridge pin hole and we're checking along the edge of the neck to make sure that when we fret it doesn't go off the edge so that's beautifully centered so now we go over to the first string so we check the first string slot in the nut and then the corresponding bridge pin hole and again that comes along nicely uh, we're well away from the beveled ends of the frets no issues there so the next thing that needs to be understood is, so now where it meets the body, there's going to be a high spot. When I put that straight edge there, you can see how much it's rocking. We work specifically on the highest spot with a very short block, and it's not a big wide block. It's narrower than the fingerboard, and I'll set the timer just so you can see how quickly we take care of this. Okay, let's get started. We start with a little mini scrub block on the highest part. Go to our next longer block, still concentrating on that hump. going to our next length of block. By getting rid of this high spot we're basically blending this whole thing right to the last fret. Okay, let's stop for a second and check. How much difference did that make? Uh, <laughs> quite a bit. We're right up to here now. So still concentrating on the top and right to the end of the fingerboard, taking out that high spot. Again. This is still pretty exaggerated. So I'm going back to the shorter block for another run. Check that again. Oh yeah, we're getting there now. There's a little bit of fall off on the top end and that's that's not too bad. It's much improved from what it was. Still going to our medium length small block 
Okay. Now we're going to step it up to the longer run again. And now we're going to spread it out a little bit further. Towards the tenth fret and up. Okay, I'm, I'm liking that. So when I lay that straight edge along the crowns of these frets, well we've made tons of progress in that three minute sanding session. I do an eight count of sanding strokes, like one, two, three, four, six, seven, eight. Wow, that's great. Okay, so we've arrived. So something I want to explain here. These sanding blocks have a slip of leather and I get the local Amish to sort of cut the leather to the right thickness so that there's just enough flexibility to follow the curvature of the fingerboard. And you want it to be narrower because as I sand, I'm thinking of the trajectory of the string path. I'm sanding along the string path. So what we end up with, we get a perfect radius match and I'm going to bring you in in a second to show you. I'm going to get a tracing off this fret and we're going to check just how accurate we are here. Okay, this is the tracing that I took off the fingerboard. Let's see how accurate we are. How's that for accuracy? I never made any conscious effort to try and copy the radius. That flex in the leather block, and this is a jointed quarter sawn block, dead flat. The flex in the leather naturally followed that exact radius. So without even trying, we've got a perfect radius match. So what you're looking at here is the frets in the order that they came out. Now this is one place where I do use a black magic marker to mark the base side of the fret. Black for base. All these frets are going in exactly where they came out. Okay, here's another Martin guitar tip. So, the truss rod adjustment is way in there. Your regular Allen key is not going to work. I take a T-handled Allen key, cut off half, shove it into the sound hole, back it up, and then feed it right in to that truss rod nut. And the other bonus is you actually have quite a bit of leverage now because you've got a handle. The neck is dead straight, so I want to actually encourage a little bit of relief in that neck, so I'm going to back it off. So we're ready to throw some strings on. Nobody would ever know that this neck was ever reset. It's right back to factory spec. So you can take a look at that action now. This thing is buttery smooth. There's our finished neck reset at the heel to side junction on the treble side and that's a look at the base side and there's the heel cap. Well now at long last after all that work uh, we get to hear the guitar so and like I'd mentioned in that Taylor video resetting the neck is not just about making the guitar easier to play more importantly it regulates the guitar so that it plays in tune across the entire span of the neck. So let me just give you a rundown here quickly. It's much, much closer than it was. It was essentially impossible to play before we did that neck reset. It's not just that it's buttery smooth to play now, but it definitely intonates a lot better. And the other thing I noticed with this, with this neck, there was a little bit of an offset in this direction, which means I ended up lowering the saddle on the base side. It's actually lower on the base side than it is on the treble side. Well, you saw earlier in the video where I, I talked about the six different planes that have to be right. Well, with this guitar, because it's a tenon and mortise, we were kind of limited to do anything this way. So this is the way it came. It just had a slight cant like that. And that's fine. We took care of it at the bridge. So the most important thing is it's silky smooth to play now. And it plays pretty darn close.
even without a compensated that you know it ended up being a much bigger job than I'd anticipated I didn't want to s surprise the customer with a huge bill I really try to stick close to my quotes you don't want to take work in. So because this is so close, I've opted not to go with a compensated nut, and that's something Jody can decide on later. I think he's going to be very happy with this just the way it is. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I had that recording that I'd recorded on the Taylor guitar, which was sort of a plug-in acoustic electric system, and I'm going to let that play, and I'm going to blow over that same uh, C minor thing uh, with the Martin guitar acoustically. I'll give you a chance to hear this. Okay, here we go.
I'll just play through some common chords. And of course you can do the sort of regular bluegrass stuff that uh, Martin Guitars is so famous for. So that about wraps it up for this uh, Martin guitar.